This is Origin Stories, the Leaky Foundation podcast. I'm Meredith Johnson. On this episode, we'll hear the story of a remarkable discovery, a discovery that's changed our understanding of early human evolution. Producer Skylar Swenson brings us the story. We human beings are very curious to know about where we came from, and how we evolved, who we are. Everybody should care, you know, to know where we came from. That's what I say. This is Chalachu Seyum. He was born and raised in Ethiopia. For scholars of human evolution, the country's a gold mine, an unlikely gold mine. Oh, it's, it's really a desert, Sh- you know, small trees, no sheds. It's full of sediment, v- you know, no man land. It, it's not very attracting for people, for ordinary people, but for people like me, I enjoy going there. Sayum's a graduate student in paleoanthropology at Arizona State University. I love uh, to see that kind of landscape because that's where we found most of these amazing discoveries all over the world. In January 2013, he joined a team of scientists in Leodoita in the Afar region of Ethiopia. At a site known as Ledi Gararu, they were searching for signs of early hominids, our early human ancestors. We knew it was going to be hard work, but if we could find anything, it would be exciting. This is Kay Reed. She's co-leader of the team at Ledi Gararu. She's a paleoecologist at Arizona State University, and she studies the environments and lifestyles of early hominids. Reed and her colleagues have been surveying at Ledi Gararu on and off for nearly a decade. We would go out there for six weeks and just walk. We used to call them death marches because there's a lot of sediments out there that have no fossils. They're lake sediments, and it's a deep lake, so you get a lot of fish, but you don't find other types of animals. Sayum says these sediments are actually really important to their process. One of the first steps in a search for ancient fossils is dating the land. The sediment from the Ledi Gararo site shows that it's around 2.8 million years old, a time period that we don't have a lot of hominid fossils from. So anything we found between that time period is going to be important in understanding human evolutionary study. Reed says geologists spent about three years studying sediments before they even started collecting anything. After all this time in the field, Reed knows all the ins and outs of setting up camp. It goes from nothing in a space to to a space with 45 personal tents, three large tents, a science tent, a cook tent, a dining tent. We have great food in the field um, thanks to our kitchen crew. We have pizza. They break bread every day in an oven. They dig a hole in the earth and they have charcoal around it and generators and shower equipment and toilet seats for the long drop toilets. This pop-up camp becomes home base for the team. They're archaeologists, paleoanthropologists, geologists. They eat an early breakfast, hop in land cruisers, and drive into the hilly, arid landscape to begin the day's work. We arrive at the site, which is not exactly at the site, it's at the edge of this basin, and we get all of our equipment out of the car, the cameras, our backpacks, our water, because it's hot, and everyone gathers that. And then usually I give directions. You know, it's okay, so today we're gonna go here and This is why we're going here. This is our best chance of finding a hominid. And then we come down into the basin, and this particular basin is a pretty steep trail. It's an old camel trail. Everyone sets down their backpack and kind of gets to the business of starting finding fossils, and we go from there. When the team finds a concentration of fossils, it's Reed's job to help identify them. She records what they find and logs their coordinates in a GPS device. In the days before their historic discovery at Ledi Gararu, the team found themselves at an extra exciting site. They find ancient giraffe teeth. And by ancient, I mean this thing is called Shivatherium. It was like a giant giraffe. It weighed probably two tons. So they have, we had giraffe teeth. We have monkeys from this locality. We have all kinds of antelope. We have pigs. And it's a very small area, about the size of a hotel room, like sort of down on the the slopes of this hill. So people had been going up the hill and then you could walk on top of this hill, which is where Chilacha was. I came across a hill and I just climbed and checked the plateau and there's nothing there. And just I started to walking to the other side of the hill and the piece of the tears is sticking out of the sediment just caught my eyes and it is really 
intact with a piece of jaw and I picked it up and the piece is missing. Sayum had a feeling the missing piece was nearby. He decided to keep searching for it before telling the rest of the team. He didn't want people to rush to the scene and step on the piece, so he kept quiet. And then he found another piece. And when I put them together, they perfectly fit and just make one complete jaw, the left side of the jaw. So then I called Kerry. And I heard him yelling, K, K, and finally he said, K Reed. And I was like, what? He said, I think we have one. I knew it was a hominin even I, before I picked up the piece of the jaw. I knew it was going to be very important. Well, I knew exactly what he meant. I think we have one. That's the only, I mean, he had a hominid. So I started running up the hill. Well, you can't run up this hill. It's so steep. So I crawled like the, the last um, couple of meters <laughs> to get over the top so I could see. I was quiet, you know, even I wasn't talking because I was very excited and uh, surprised, you know. Yeah, we made it, you know. The project, the members of the project have been working in that side for more than 10 years and they didn't find any significant hominin fossils. That made me really feel happy. He was um, standing there holding it in his hands and it's really had the left half of an entire mandible. It was in two pieces and it still has dirt and the silt on it, it came out of a silt sediment. Everyone ran up there and <laughs> I'm trying to say, don't step on it, just stay back because we have to look for other pieces and I'm trying to keep everyone back, but everyone was yelling and excited. They did stay back, it was great, but they were still jumping around and it was very exciting. After almost a decade of searching for hominid remains, the team's efforts finally resulted in something big. No, we didn't have champagne, but I did. we did send someone in to get beer, cold beer. Cold beer is very nice when you're in a very hot place. They didn't only find a hominid, they found what looked like a species from our same genus, Homo, and it was 2.8 million years old. The Homo genus wasn't supposed to have existed that long ago. This genus is really the most recent branch of our family tree. It includes species like Homo erectus and Neanderthals, and of course, us, Homo sapiens. It is Homo because it has what we call derived features. So as evolution progresses, an organism, uh, if it's changing or evolving, gets new characteristics. So those new characteristics are derived from the older species. Older species like Australopithecus afarensis. The most famous fossilized afarensis was nicknamed Lucy. She was found in Hadar, Ethiopia in 1974, about 25 miles away from Leti Gararu. On that mandible, I think there are 12 different features that are new features from afarensis as a group and are associated with Homo. They now need to figure out just how human-like the owner of this jawbone actually was and what this might tell us about the timeline of human evolution. Susan Antone's a professor of anthropology at New York University. She remembers first reading about the Leti Gararu jawbone in the journal Science last March. She says the big thing about the new jawbone is that it shows the human genus Homo existed way earlier than we thought. That has some implications for what we think our first Homo ancestors looked like. It turns out that early humans didn't look very much like us, and it's been hard for us to sort of take that on board and kind of encompass that within our thinking about what it means to be human. Because it turns out that we're actually pretty remarkable in that, you know, we've got these really big brains, we've got these really tiny faces, we have these not very well muscled bodies, and we had this expectation that as we went back in the fossil record, we would see many of those things in our early ancestors, and, and we don't. Turns out our human ancestors had much smaller brains, much bigger faces, bigger teeth, and more muscular bodies. 
the new fossil, which has been defined as being a member of HOMO, um, has some characteristics that are like us, but it also has some characteristics that are a bit more like Lucy. And so it kind of ties that that common idea or that common hypothesis that that Lucy's species was our, our common ancestor. It kind of ties that species in with our genus more directly than it had been before. The Letty Gararu jawbone tells us that our human genus Homo started only about 200,000 years after Lucy. That's about half a million years earlier than we thought before. Anton says piecing together the story of human evolution is like trying to draw a picture from a connect the dots puzzle with a bunch of the dots missing. And you're not really aware of what the other points are going to be. And sometimes you, you, know, you put a point into your picture and all of a sudden the entire picture changes. The Letty Gararu jawbone is that picture-changing dot. We're finding that our genus Homo is a lot older than we thought. The earliest stone tools are a lot older than we thought, and so are a lot of behaviors and lifestyles. We have now more teams that are working in that time period. We're going to learn a lot more about, about what does it mean and who was making those tools, um, how many taxa, how many species were there. Um, that of, of early Homo, how did they differ, what did they look like, what were they eating, and so on. Anton points out that this jawbone's also special because of how intact and well-preserved it is. And it's really important because the things that we had before, even the earliest things that we had before, they were really scrappy, little kind of nasty pieces of, of bits and bobs that you kind of tried to put together into to, to some kind of a picture of what early Homo looked like. Um, this, this particular specimen is, is much more complete and, and gives us a, a much better picture. It's now been two years since they found the jawbone, and Kay Reed and her team are still finding more evidence of hominid life at Letty Gararu. What we need are more definitive um, pieces of the skull, I think. We went, we went back this year in 2015 and we found three different teeth, none of which fit on the mandible, so they're different, but none of them belong to each other either because of different wear, so there's four individuals from that locality four different homo specimens at Letty Gararo, which means there's probably still a lot more to discover. That doesn't surprise Susan Anton. You know, when you read a book and you read a, a popular novel or you read a textbook, it makes it sound like we know all of the, the answers and that we know all of this information. And the truth of the matter is that there is a huge, vast wilderness that's unexplored out there. Paleoanthropology is still a really young science. There's a lot about human evolution we haven't figured out yet. And the Letty Gararu jawbone brings with it more questions than answers. But that's exciting for Chalachu Sayum. Most people question me, why the general public care about this science? And for me, I would say it's just asking the same question. Why we care about our grandparents? or great-great-parents. If you expand this question, it will be where we came from originally. If you push the question, great, 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 then it just falls on these fossils. Sayum plans to continue work at Letty Gararo and hopes to stay working in Ethiopia. He says in the future, he'd really like to find a skull. For Origin Stories, I'm Skylar Swenson. Thanks for listening to Origin Stories. Today's episode was produced by Skylar Swenson. Our editor is Audrey Quinn. Music and scoring by Henry Nagel. And we had production help from Brianna Breen. Origin Stories is a project of the Leakey Foundation. The Leakey Foundation funds research into human origins and shares that information with the public. The Leakey Foundation also funds postgraduate education for scholars from developing countries through their innovative Baldwin Fellowship Program. You can learn more and support science at leakyfoundation.org. That's L-E-A-K-E-Y foundation.org. You can find and follow the Leaky Foundation on Facebook and Twitter, too. Thanks to Kay Reed and Chalachu Sium for sharing the story of their amazing discovery, and to Susan Antone from NYU. You can find links to more information about their work on our website, originstoriespodcast.org. 
Origin Stories was made possible by a grant from Wells Fargo Bank. Transcripts are provided by Adept Word Management, Intelligent Transcripts. Their website is adeptwordmanagement.com. If you like our show, please rate and review us on iTunes. It really makes a difference and helps other people find the show. Thanks so much to all of you who've already reviewed. We really appreciate it.